because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Today's subject is climate scientocracy. So what is scientocracy, you might ask? Well, our guest will be the expert on this since he wrote, literally wrote the book on scientocracy. But to me, scientocracy is a government that intrudes in science and then is also takes dictatorial action uh, on the basis of many of its intrusions and dis- uh, intrusions in science and distortions uh, of science. And I'm particularly interested these days in our climate scientocracy because I believe that from research to what we, the most basic research conducted to what we get from the New York Times to what we hear from our politicians, uh, all of that is distorted by government and by certain agendas in government. And so to discuss this issue of a long time uh, guy I've admired. I think he's maybe the first climate scientist I ever heard of when I was a, a teenager, and I've gotten to know him over the years. In fact, I got to know him fairly well 10 years ago when I won a contest that he held at the Heartland Institute conference, and so we got to have a beer together because I immediately recognized a, an image of the State Science Institute from Atlas Shrugged, and so I got to know him then, and it's been, it's been good to get to know him ever since. Uh, so uh, his name is Pat Michaels. He's a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Also, very importantly, had a long time career as a climate scientist. And so he brings uh, both a lot of knowledge of climate science, but also of the distorting mechanisms of government to the table. So Pat Michaels, welcome back to Power Hour. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm feeling powerful already. All right, good. And I like the enjoy capitalism uh, shirt. So let's start with an overview. I'd, I'd love to know just your view of over your career or maybe even longer, how has climate research and the public communication of climate research been affected by government? Well, nothing will teach you more about what's wrong with science than being a university climate science researcher for 30 years. Um, basically, when it started out, it was fairly honest, but then the money gravitated to uh, uh, carbon dioxide is going to cause these horrible things. Uh, I actually uncovered a memorandum from Michael McCracken, who was the head of something called the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, he sent it to the wrong email list late on a Christmas night. Uh, I, I think it was not supposed to go to me bragging about how they hoodwinked Jimmy Carter into uh, the global warming thing because Carter wanted nuclear, or as Carter would say, nuclear power. Uh, and they knew full well that wasn't going to ride. So they got their way uh, on reducing emissions. Uh, and that's, that was the first salvo in the climate science war. And it's gotten much, much, much worse. Um, <clears throat> I used to publish research that I thought was irrelevant because if I said what I really wanted to and I could show what I really wanted to, it would never get published. I had a million rejections on my client science stuff and um, wonderful acceptance on how pine beetles invade forests if the weather's warm. Uh, <clears throat> got reviewed by the dean. I said, your pine beetle work, that was really great. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the worst stuff I ever did. What happens in science when the government takes it over and the universities have to follow the government's point of view because the faculty aren't gonna get grants. I mean, if you write a, a grant proposal that says, you know, global warming is overrated and really isn't gonna do all that much, it's gonna get ash can. It'll never get to full review. If you write the proposal that says global warming is going to kill billions and I have a model, oh my God, They'll give you more money than you asked for. That's how science gets colored. And when, when these uh, organizations like the UN or the US Global Change Research Program summarize everything that's in the literature, say every four to six years, well, you know, if they're being honest, they're gonna summarize a literature describing disaster because others need not apply. They need not even send the manuscript in. 
Interesting. Okay. So there's a lot of mechanisms you're talking about there and I'm, I'm glad you gave an overview. So I want to go into some of the details first. I'm curious about the funding of research because, you know, in, in, in Scientocracy, you talk about how there's essentially one funder of climate research now, which yeah. is the federal government, and that's funneled through many channels. What was it like, say, even before your time, like in 1950, 1960, 1970, like what was funding this research? Well, that's an interesting question because uh, unlike almost every branch of science, uh, meteorology then slash climatology uh, had a strong military overtone. And so it, this was science made for big government. Now, in the 1970s, uh, the reigning paradigm was that science doesn't, or weather doesn't change, climate doesn't change. It's all a little, you know, a fairly stable system. You know, guys like me raising, hey, hey, we're in Madison, Wisconsin now. You know, uh, there was 6,000 feet of ice over here 11,000 years ago, and you're telling me climate doesn't change. Uh, well, then by the late 70s, a man who was my mentor, the late Reed Bryson from the University of Wisconsin, uh, cooked up some work that showed that indeed people could claim change the climate. And because of all the crap that we're throwing in the air, you probably could cool it down. This happened in the mid 1970s after a sharp cooling that occurred from 1950 to 1975 in the Northern Hemisphere. And so therefore, you know what comes next, we all believe the ice age is coming. Uh, I couldn't warm up to that one either. Uh, and finally, the, the power of global warming via Mike McCracken whispering in Jimmy Carter's ear that, you know, the, the, we're, we're going to burn unless we stop burning fossil fuels. Uh, that became the paradigm. That paradigm still exists today. Uh, and it is, it, it, while it is warming up, it will warm up. Uh, may I ask a silly question to you, Alex? Sure. Are you dead yet? Can I ask you a second question? Is your life expectancy longer than it was, would be if you were born a hundred years ago? Three, how about your per capita wealth? How many times is it what it would have been in the year 1900? The answer is 12. Now fossil fuels didn't cause this. They caused some of it, but they sure as heck didn't, didn't stop it. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I would, well, in my next book, I argue for pretty strong uh, causal role in part because so much right. of the production is machines. And that means you're, that means the fuel is the fuel in the machines, but also the fuel the machines are using, but also all the fuel used by the thousands of machines that make every machine. And then the machines are freeing up time by taking away time from our basic needs. And so, you know, that's what drives innovation is all the freed up time plus the machines for people to do research development. And yeah, now they can spend time looking at a computer screen and downloading cat videos. Well, yeah. And, and things even more uh, productive than that. But let's, so if we take, so you mentioned- that's very the, productive. You don't like cats? Well, I, I like dogs. <laughs> I have a dog, a giant wiener dog, 32 pound wiener dog named Anthony Wiener. Is that true? Yes, and at night, I, maybe we'll have one of his business cards. At night, his name is Char Carlos Danger, of course. There, you don't believe me? Anthony Wiener Dog. Wow, wow, you really have, you really have uh, gone a hundred percent with that one. Uh, so let me ask about the the. So I think it's interesting. You know, you talk about cooling and warming. So in both cases, you're referring to like extreme implica right. alleged implications of that. But I think it's important. Both of those are, they're real physical mechanisms at work. That is right. Sure. I mean, we can emit aerosols and that can have a cooling kind of impact just as like if you have Pinatubo erupt, that can have a cooling impact on the atmosphere. And yeah. then all things be equal, if you put more of infrared absorbers slash greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that'll lead to warming. But it's, I think it's notable that in both cases, um, a real mechanism, there was a certain kind of profitability for people to turn a mechanism that might have been rather minor and make it into a catastrophe. Oh, absolutely. And you have to understand the way the scientocracy <clears throat> uh, dynamic functions. Here in this, this cesspool of Washington, 
<clears throat> that is where all scientific money comes from. Now, <clears throat> am I going to get money? Is my issue going to get money if I sit, stand in front of Congress and say, ah, oh, global warming is no big deal? No, the money is going to go elsewhere. So the scientists are incented to hawk the extreme. And it's not just on climate change. This uh, <clears throat> fine book, Scientocracy, has 13 separate areas where you can see it happening. <clears throat> and uh, I'm telling you, uh, you better keep your eyes on your fries if you own something that the government might, might not want you to own. Uh, <clears throat> can I talk about an important chapter in the book that's not climate change? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> there is a, nobody would believe me, but the largest uranium deposit in the United States is 195 miles south of right where I am. It's on the North Carolina, Virginia border. <clears throat> and it's all under one guy's land. The price of uranium went up uh, around 2003. And it's, it, there's so much of it, you hardly have to dig it. Some of the rocks are sitting on the surface. And he said, I'm gonna do this the right way. He came up, up to me because he was sad that the government appears to be against him exploiting his own private property. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, I wanted to do it right. I went to the National, the National Academy of Sciences. And I said, can you do me a report on how to mine uranium in Virginia? And I said to him, uh, Mr. Jones, that wasn't a good idea, was it? And by the way, who had to pay for the report? You did. So he forks out a million dollars for the government to gather a group of scientists. And you look at the CVs of the scientists and you know what they're gonna say. There are gonna be a couple that are gonna be pro-mining. The majority of them aren't. Uh, so they get the report that they want that's politically correct. Uh, and um, his stock, turns from like $8 a share to a couple of pennies. The guy was pretty much bankrupted by the scientific establishment. What, what the National Academy does is they create reports with foregone conclusions. The head of whatever committee it is says, ah, we'll get five of these guys and 10 of these guys. And to find out what really happened, you gotta go to the five of these guys because they're gonna be complaining uh, and that's described in Scientocracy. Oh, by the way, for what it's worth, let's get climate in on this. Why can't you mine uranium in Virginia? The report said, because it rained and there's flood. And who is the source of it rains in Virginia and it floods? Well, the old state climatologist for Virginia, that would be me. I was the reason that this guy got his money, his property taken away from him. That's the way it works. Wow, yeah. Um, so let's, I, I, I'm curious. So just to go back a little bit in history, yeah. you talked about some of the dynamics of how it's been corrupted. What about, how did how were competing ideas addressed? So if you take like the 70s and before, I mean, my, my general impression, more than an impression of science, is that the less the government invol is involved, the more it's competitive, where you have different kinds of cliques sure. and groups and they're arguing and fighting and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, they, they sort of, you get some sort of the right views arise, you know, emerging over time. But, you know, right now, if you look at it, obviously the government wants one view which is rising CO2 levels are catastrophic. So I'm just curious what it used to be like. Cause you know, right now, if you, you got a real innovator who's saying like, oh, I've really shown definitively that equilibrium climate sensitivity is not that high. Like that would be an unwelcome kind of thing. You think? To explore. Um, but yeah, what was it, you know, what would it, you know, what was it like, you know, in the early seventies or before the competition element? Yeah, it was still monolithic. Um, the scientists are more closely related to lemmings, I think, than they are to, to uh, great apes. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you look at what, what is a tremendous work, um, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, 
highly recommended. You only have to read the first 75 pages because he repeats himself a jillion times after that. But he was the guy who coined the phrase paradigm in science. And what he shows in scientific fields, everybody does the same thing. You don't want to rock the boat. And so scientists spend their careers maybe chinking up a little hole or putting a patch on this paradigm. And paradigms usually change very suddenly. Uh, oftentimes, it's a person who is not a practitioner in the field that will cause change. Uh, I, I can give you a, a really nice example. Yeah, do. There was a mail carrier uh, in the 19-teens who published something that said something to the effect that the faster you go, the slower time moves. And people go, what? Well, of course, that was Albert Einstein. He was way on the outside of this. And uh, he didn't overturn Newtonian dynamics. Newtonian dynamics is merely a subset of Einsteinian relativity. It's a boring subset compared to what happens when we get going to speed of light. But it took something like that to change the paradigm. Now, let's do something new. Let's have the government be the sole funder of a paradigm. Paradigm in my field, climate change models are great. They tell us what the future is gonna be. And of course, we don't know exactly what the emissions are gonna be, but we're gonna guess they're gonna be high and the models are real hot. So the world's coming to an end. Now there may be a problem here. Could you please give me a few, a few more million dollars to study this? Uh, I don't have enough miles and I, I really don't wanna be in coach. Consider the scientist who says, well, and this is Judy Curry, uh, did this a couple of years ago with Nick Lewis. Hey, if we look at the CO2 going in the air and we look at the aerosols, they're supposed to counter it going in the air with real numbers. And we don't want run one of these fancy damn 50 dimensional models that can be fudged in any way. We just use a very basic physics approach. We get an equilibrium climate sensitivity of about 1.6 degrees Celsius. That's the theoretical amount of warming you'd get for doubling CO2. The UN's models in their latest iteration have an equilibrium sensitivity of 3.4. Uh, and they make errors all over the tropics. I, I can show you a picture. I don't want to mess up your screen uh, from John Christie. I don't know. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Can we pause for a second? This is the bottom of the troposphere, five to 30,000 feet. These are the observed temperatures from weather balloons, uh, from satellites, and something called reanalysis product project. And this is what the models say should be going on beginning in 1979 when the satellite starts. Now, if that's not failure, I don't know what is. But that was in the tropics. It's uh, from 20 north to 20 south. We have a new generation of models. It's called the CMIP-6 version. It's coming in, it's almost complete. And Ross McKittrick and John Christie from the University of Alabama at Huntsville have looked at them. And as they concluded, this is amazing. The error that the models were making in the tropics has now propagated the entire globe. In other words, the models got worse. Oh, these models are warmer too. And the warmer they are, the worse they do in the last 30 years. I mean, science is supposed to correct this stuff, not have people get in a room and say, let's make it worse so we can scare people more. And by the way, that is what they do. Uh, I, I can stand by that. I mean, I, I, I can cite a paper by uh, Frederick Hordan, who heads the French climate modeling effort. And he published a paper called The Art and the Science of Climate Model Tuning. In other words, all these models are made to mimic the course of the 20th century. Uh, and by doing that, they blow up when you actually ask them to forecast. And <clears throat> there are all these tunable parameters. CO2 is just one of them. Aerosols are just one of them. The way things mix in the ocean, just one of them. You tune these things and he says, 
we do this, I'm quoting the head of the French climate modeling effort, Frederick Cornyn, to get a quote, anticipated acceptable result, end quote. So what's going on in climate science? Do we have these objective models? No, we have models and then we tune them to give the anticipated acceptable result. I mean, that just blows me away. And if you, if you don't believe me, look at Science Magazine, October 26, 1916, uh, 2016 rather, uh, where there's an article by Paul Vusen, a news article where they go into this. Uh, and the article even details how one modeling group, Max Planck Institute, uh, the boss was indisposed and so so the grad students and the postdocs had to run it. They got an equilibrium climate sensitivity of 7.1 degrees. And they told Science Magazine, quote, we had to get that number down. So if this sounds like science, I, I don't think I can tell you a better fairy tale. I mean, you know, I think one aspect of science is it's, I mean, in general, it's hard. And then you always have a frontier of it that's much more speculative and that's okay, but that's perfect for government to manipulate because sure. they, they have, there are benefits that various benefits people can get through extreme predictions about the future. And so oh yeah. <laughs> you're going to get newspaper headlines. You're going to get, it's, it's what's called uh, flashy science. Um, it's gotten so bad that uh, Randy Shackman got the Nobel Prize in 2013 in physiology or medicine. By the way, that's not a misspeak. It is physiology or medicine. And the day he got the prize, he wrote an op-ed, published it in all places, The Guardian. And you know what he said? I'm not sending any more manuscripts to science, nature, or cell. He's a cell biologist. Um, because all these people are doing is publishing flashy, trendy science that will get them in the news. And it's crowding out the real science that we really need to be doing. This is the guy that just won the Nobel. Wow. You I said, I'm, I'm opting out, that. bye. It's, it's that bad. Yeah, hey, you know, a... Are you familiar with uh, Eric Kaufman's work? No. Oh, he just published a 200 page single space monograph on bias in the academy. I mean, I think Scientocracy is a great book, okay? And, and you should buy this book. It's really cool, fun to read. Kaufman's not as fun to read because he's describing a slow moving train wreck. Uh, I just pub, uh, put in a 3000 word uh, piece called uh, The Impending Death of the American Academy. It, it predicts horrible things that are happening and will continue to happen and seem to be inevitable that science uh, and not just hard sciences, of course, but social sciences, et cetera, are now self-selecting for the left so extremely that there are basically no, nobody who's left is in the center. And they, they, they either leave like I did. I mean, I don't know how I took 30 years of it uh, or they they don't give them tenure uh, and they have to have to go out. So the composition of the scientific academy drifts further and further and further toward status because they have to be supported by the state. If you don't get that that state money, you're not going to publish enough. And even even if you're to the left of uh, of Lenin, uh, they're still they're they're going to they're going to publish. They're not going to renew you if you don't publish. And so the literature then becomes increasingly biased. Now, that literature, that scientific literature is to a scientist and to a, a, a knowing political figure, that's the canon of knowledge. That's our Bible. And our Bible is successively and serially becoming a, a monolith supporting big government. It's, it's horrendous now. Uh, I I've seen a couple of examples in the last week. So I think it's really important to grasp that the whole system 
is distorted mm-hmm. and you're giving a lot of good examples of that. I think one, there are two cases in the last week where I think anyone can, can see there's distortion uh, that's in, in terms of how things are communicated to the public. So one, I, you've, I'm sure you've seen at least one of these, but one you may not have seen is the NASA climate Twitter posted this thing on sea level rises. Have you seen this? Uh, yeah, but enlighten me a little bit. Okay, yeah. So they they said, uh, this is almost a direct quote, but I, the figures are exact. I remember those very precisely. So they say, you know, it's basically breaking news. We have the latest data on rising sea levels. And guess what the data are? It's 0.13 inches per year, which is 13 inches a century, 1.1 feet a century, which that's not very scary uh, at all. But here's what they do. They say that's like it rising six inches a year in the US. So they give you this image of, oh my gosh, every year, six inches, six inches. And so what they do is they take the global rise oh, and, and they, they imagine they... that it were all in the less than 2% of the earth, that's the US. So my analogy for that is, okay, let's say it's warmed two degrees Fahrenheit in the last 170 years. Well, if that had all been in the US, it would have warmed 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So- They've done that before. Uh, they did a very similar exercise with Greenland ice about 15 years ago uh, and you know, did it in units of the United States or, or something like that to create a psychological effect. Look, NASA is shameless, okay? They're re- they were really good at getting guys on the moon. Uh, now, when they, when they switched over to climate, I'm not so sure they're good. Uh, the guy who's running their climate lab, Gavin Schmidt, he's acting running it. Uh, he's not trained in the science, but he sure knows how to fiddle with models to get him to give the answer that he wants. And he wrote a paper on all the tunable parameters in, map, in models. You know, this is like, like uh, Rommel writing, <laughs> here's how I fight a war. So. Uh, he, he, he published this thing, and it's clear that you can get any answer you want at all if you, if you use these general circulation models or Earth system models, as they're called now. Um, I actually tweeted repeatedly to Gavin. He has not responded yet, but I have a blue check. So I know if you have a blue check on Twitter, that means other people with the blue check see it because you have a special blue check update. So I know that, I mean, I'm very confident this guy has seen it. To me, this is just shameless is the right word, but this is that nobody can claim that this is science. You know, I should, tell you, I should tell you about his predecessor. <clears throat> his, his name was Sergey Lebedev. He's no longer with us. And we were at a, a scientific meeting, you know, cocktail gathering before dinner. And I was going on and saying, well, you know, you know, that you're exaggerating the warming the way you're calculating it. And the guy was per- per- perfectly honest with you. He said, yeah, if we don't do that, we won't get funded, end quote. Yeah, and even- It's you know, real. And you know, well, uh, the other thing, which I'm sure you've seen is the wildfire data. Oh, you know, since- We just got rid of the data. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is wild where it's, and, and I mean, where it's just, okay, you have wildfire acreage burned data. So I just wanna make clear, this is not like some incredibly hard to collect thing with at least some degree of accuracy. I mean, it's pretty, you know, when when acres burn, like we had the capability to measure this 50, 70 years ago, but they decided that all the acreage burned before 1983 would no longer be on the government websites. Why? So they, if they show 83 to the present, 83 is a low point, so they can make it go like that. But if you have it 100 years ago or more, then it goes, you know, it goes down and then it goes up a little bit. I mean, what this just, I mean, they, you know, there they have at least a little excuse like, oh, it wasn't, you, wasn't collected using modern collection methods. But again, the collection methods here are a hell of a lot better than like the temperature collection methods we had globally 100 years ago. And yet they're happy to use, let alone whatever Michael Mann is distorting in his stuff from tree rings. You know, um, in the third U.S. national assessment <clears throat> on climate change, <clears throat> they made a big to-do about hurricanes increasing <clears throat> from 1980 
1995 or something like that. Well, and, and strong hurricanes increasing in that period. Well, we have satellite data back to 1970 for global coverage <clears throat> and few people are gonna miss a category three or higher hurricane anyway. And when you look at all the data, so let's go, let's, let's go back to 1920. You'll see that the hurricane activity was as strong or stronger in the 1930s and the 1950s than it is now. But they started their record in, two, in 2000, uh, 1980 and ended it in 2009 in a document that was published in 2014. Wait a minute. What about 10, 11, 12, 13? Well, if you put 10, 11, 12, and 13 in, the rise vanishes. I mean, this is crass manipulation to try and scare people into policies that they've been told that we need. That's all it is. Yeah, I think it's, it's I, I'm highlighting these because I think it reveals the systemic distortion in ways that yeah. we can all verify for ourselves because others of these things are behind the scenes. Let me play devil's advocate. So, you know, Michael Mann has this argument. I'm sure others do. His view is actually, no, we welcome a refutation of climate catastrophism. If so, he, like his view is if somebody could refute me and my colleagues, they would become a star. It would be like, you know, Einstein, leaving aside the fact that Einstein had a hundred authors against Einstein, you know, attacking him. But what do, what do you say? Because they'll say like, yeah, we reward new and novel ideas. So you actually don't re get rewarded by going with the flow. You get rewarded by challenging, but just there are no challenges to our uh, elite understanding really? of climate science. You know, many people have suggested that, that Mike and I have a friendly discussion in public. And Mike has said, no, not him. Why? I'm sure I, I can find somebody who Mike can, can wub up on. There are lots of people who think they know what's going on and they don't, but there are some that do. Uh, I, I would think Judy Curry or, or Will Happer, myself, um, Steve Coonan. Uh, Steve Coonan's an interesting case. <clears throat> he has more credibility than Judy or me, because he doesn't wear a shirt like this. He used to work for the Obama crew. And so, wow, if he says that something's wrong, it's gotta be wrong. But man's not gonna debate those, us, no way. But what about just the idea that, well, the literature would welcome uh, uh -huh. You mean You mean, if I write the paper that says the earth is lukewarming, which is what it's doing, uh, and, you know, we're going to be so much richer in a hundred years, you're not going to even notice it. You're going to adapt. That's what you're doing. I mean, it's warmed up a degree since 1900. Human beings probably have maybe to do about three tenths of that to five tenths. Um, and you're, you're fine. Your life expectancy is long. Your wealth is great. Uh, you try to put that paper in. Oh, my God. I, I'm sure you're familiar with the climate gate emails that yes. leaked out of the University of East Anglia on purpose or not, I do not know. But <clears throat> uh, I had a paper that I did with Ross McKittrick uh, in which we showed the inherent errors in the surface temperature records. <clears throat> and we published it in a journal called Climate Research, which a lot of people published in. And the emails went back and forth. Uh, you know, we're supposed to review the, the referee literature and we can define what the referee literature is in this paper is. That's what they did. And so did can, it not it, get published in it? Oh, it got published, but it, it, these were people putting together an IPCC. I see, what, I see, it doesn't UM qualify. Report. They just ignore the stuff that might wreck the picture. Yeah, so let's let's use that to talk about the sausage making that is the IPCC. So it it so I mean just to give the the trajectory of it. I mean so it it, it we've talked about already how the the nature of the literature and the composition of the people in the field is already distorted by all the incentives there. That is, if if you're inclined toward lukewarming or non-catastrophism, 
you're not going to get hired. You're not going to get published nearly as much. So it's already a biased selection. But then now you're saying that even among the papers that do manage to get published, there's a further selection in yeah. terms of the IPCC. So could you elaborate on how that works? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, I, I recommend, by the way, a book by Rupert Darwall that has just come out called Green Tyranny, where he, uh, he documents how this occurred. Uh, and, and there are very, it's a very small number of players who put it forward. <clears throat> uh, one was a scientist, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in Sweden by the name of Bert Bolin. Uh, I had dinner with Bolin when this was all starting up for four excruciating hours where he talked down to me, anybody who, who disagreed and made it clear that we are going to use this issue to change the world. They, they, they when when was born. this? Oh God, that would have been somewhere around 1989 or so, quite some time ago, maybe even earlier. Um, and the, the IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it, it says in its charter, uh, we are forming this organization uh, to serve as the basis for a possible treaty on climate change. So from the get-go, it had a conclusion. And you know, dissenters need not apply. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's, we are going to use this uh, because Olaf Palme, who was the prime minister when all this was happening, he wanted to change the world and all that good stuff. And Bert Bolin, uh, was only too happy to facilitate this. Um, they did it sort of like uh, Mike McCracken did it in the Jimmy Carter administration. They wanted um, Sweden to be primarily nuclear powered. Uh, that means that everybody else is gonna be nuclear powered? The answer is no. Uh, and so, um, when you made the issue a scare issue, you brought forth things like Germany, uh, intermittent power, very expensive power, windmills, uh, solar energy, distributed power, completely going against the trend of history, which is for denser and denser and denser sources of power. It, it just creates a world that becomes increasingly uncomfortable. So once we have the distortion, so we have these distortions sort of at the front end of IPCC in terms of selecting, you know, what goes into these assessment right. reports. Uh, but then we have these assessment reports. So talk about how, I mean, this is something that is known, I think, to people in climate science, but not more widely, how what's in the reports themselves, which is distorted, how that further gets distorted by the summaries for policymakers. Sure. These reports, uh, each one is about, they're, they're a series, be three documents, about this thick. Um, and you got to understand, if they're going to be a literature summary, which is what they are in large part, they're going to paint a pretty dire picture because you don't keep getting your money for saying this isn't an issue. So even if they're perfectly accurate, they're going to be biased. But then they write some things called the summaries for policymakers for each of these three volumes. That might be about 25 pages with a lot of pictures. And all the caveats, all the ifs or buts, they're taken out. Uh, and, and, and in the second one, uh, the second one, which I believe was 1995 or 96, uh, said nothing about attribution of the current climate to what people were doing. And somehow in the policymaker summary, uh, it was written that there's now a discernible human influence on global climate. That was written after the fact it was written by a guy by the name of Ben Santer from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, your tax dollars at work. And he knew that it would go in there. And wow, 
the UN has changed its tune. Now it's real. And what paper was that based on? His unpublished paper. Uh, and it was a very interesting paper too, though. It was a paper that looked at um, temperature changes in the three-dimensional atmosphere from 1963 to 1988. The paper was published in 1996. And cynics like me go, wait a minute, you have data, the upper air data begins in 1957, not 1963. And 1963 was a big volcano. So it's gonna start off real low. And there's been, let's see, wow, 1999, 1990, Mount Pinatubo, and then it warms up after that. Uh, where's the rest of your data, Toots? So we plotted it out. And here's what Sanders', Sanders correspondence between the models and reality looked like. I'm just gonna draw you a fake graph. Do, 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 do. Oh boy, they're going up right. And then when we started in 1957, it goes like this, goes tonight down to there. It's a straight line, flat. And uh, we sent that to Nature. Nature actually published it. And then they gave him uh, the last word. And he wrote about 1,000 words that were like climate newspeak. You know, those papers that are generated now with Right, uh, 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 like clause generators. Uh -huh. I could make I could make zero sense out of it. Maybe I'm just stupid. So we've got these distortion. I mean, so look at this: the whole system. So the system is it's selecting for catastrophist research researchers, and then that gets further selected for catastrophism in terms of what's considered the literature for the IPCC. And then that gets way distorted by the summaries for policymakers. And then let's not forget the final distortion, which is the news media, which mm -hmm. takes that even further. Can you talk about how they even go further with the distortions? Well, sure. If it bleeds, it leads. I mean, I am surprised that we haven't had an epidemic of apocalypse fatigue because there are just so many of them. They're so common. But, uh, you know, um, it sort of has to work that way. I, I, I hate to say it because again, scientists are competing with each other for money. And the guy who says, oh, this is no big deal. We're gonna, we're gonna pay for that. But let, let's, let's work by example if we could, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> let's start from a congressional hearing. And Al Gore is running the hearing and he asks the administrator of NASA at the hearing. It's all hypothetical. Uh, not very hypothetical. Uh, very close to what happened. Uh, I've heard that global warming, well, I can do, do it as Al Gore would do it. I've heard that global warming is the most important problem confronting mankind. Could your agency use $3 billion or so next year to study this? Is it that important? Well, the administrator goes, hell yes, it's important. We'll, we'll, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. And so now the administrator turns to his vice presidents essentially and says, we got all this money. We got to figure out what we're going to do with it. And so the vice presidents go to the worker bee scientists and say, uh, write me a grant proposal. And you think anybody's going to write a grant proposal that says, well, it's overblown and people are going to probably prosper? Oh, that'll never get funded. That'll probably wreck NASA's chance for ongoing funding. No, but if the guy writes the proposal and says, our hypothesis is that this will kill 3 billion people in the 21st century, and here's why, that's gonna get funded. And what happens when that paper gets sent out for peer review? Who does it go to? It goes to the other guys who got the money. And so nobody wants to fly and coach and get off the gravy train so the most outrageous stuff gets published and I'll uh, consider the poor guy who on his own wrote, you know, wrote a, wrote a book, something like Luke Warming or something like that. Uh, and he wants to write a paper that's not so bad. What do you think the reviewers are gonna say about that paper? 
oh my God, he ignored this incredible body of literature that we have hundreds of papers saying other things. Ah, no, we can't publish this guy. It's not, it's just not right. And that's how science decays. You are watching, um, I, I think it's gonna go, it's going into an exponential decay. Uh, this started out in the social sciences with Brian Nosek at UVA, where he found out you couldn't replicate 65% of the published papers in the field. Uh, <laughs> I guarantee you, uh, in climate science, you can't replicate, or you, you would non-replicate pretty much any climate model except one because you don't know what knob to choose to get the anticipated acceptable results. They don't talk about it. They are not candid. And Hordan called them out on it and says, we gotta be candid about what we're doing. You know why? Because if people find out we're doing this, the skeptics are gonna say, well, why are we spending all this money on these guys? And why are we doing these policies? You're gonna give them a gun to shoot us with. He didn't quite use those words. But that is what happened. Can I digress? Uh, yeah. Can you hold the thought for a second? Because I wanted to run something by you that okay, go ahead. occurred to me that I hadn't thought of in the same way. I, I, I thought of something in a new way once you were with your last explanation. So I just maybe this is obvious to people, but you think about government funded, if, if I think of like free science, like science in a free society, you know, there's a pretty high there's not much of a tendency toward apocalypse pseudoscience. Like most of the function of science is, you know, being funded by people who want to make things better to actually discover things. And you'll have some people who are interested in, you know, just like certain problems and stuff, but usually you have to have evidence of the problems. They have to progress to a certain degree. But if you look at like government science or pseudoscience, it's, it's like the exact opposite because you have people who, particularly in a, you know, a highly controlled state like we have, like there are a whole, pe whole bunch of people whose basic philosophy is they want more and more control over our lives. And apocalypse is the thing that most achieves that goal. So whereas in a free society, you don't have that option. Like you don't get to control people, but in government you do. So I just, I'm just seeing this whole funding mechanism in terms of, yeah, if you want to get control, if you want to increase your control, maybe the most effective thing you can do is fund apocalypse science. And based on what you're talking about here, like we know for sure this is possible. So, so whenever we hear any apocalypse science from the government, we should at least know that it could easily be this kind of uh, distortion. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, we have one going on right before our eyes where huh, Dr. Fauci is now calling for vaccination of six months old. And now, excuse me, the number of deaths from, I'll call it because that's where it came from, the Wuhan virus uh, among the youth is vanishingly small. It might, might not even come out of the noise. Uh, but that certainly does build up the case for hysteria. And, you know, we're going to, we need to depend upon, upon these guys. Uh, by the way, if you want to see a real sordid tale of the internationalizing of the destruction of science, follow what's about to come out uh, on the Wuhan virus and our CDC. That's all I'm saying. Great. Well, we have, I think, I like having, the reason I wanted to have you on is so we could just see the stages of distortion happening when the government gets involved with, uh, with science, which is thought of as a, as at worst an innocuous thing and at best a, an incredibly beneficent thing. So I think we've seen that's the opposite of the truth. Uh, just talk a little bit about what's the corrective. I mean, what, what can we push yeah. for short term and long term? so that we can have a truly uh, competitive market in science? Well, people off, often ask me, you know, I mean, I can give a, I think a reasonable lecture on the climate change issue and, you know, how few clothes the emperor is wearing. But 
they ask, well, what can we do about it? Um, my answer is always cut off the funding. There's so much funding chasing. I mean, how many really brilliant scientists are there? You know what the answer is? Not many. But the more money you throw on the floor, it's like mice coming out looking after cheese. You know, they're not, the, they're, they're not necessarily all bright. And so that taints the science. And you have more people that have to say the same thing. That taints the science. Cut off the money. I mean, the Australian government a few years ago, uh, I think it was when Prime, uh, Prime Minister Abbott came in, he said, oh, CSIRO, that's their big science organization. You guys say that you have high confidence in these climate models, so we're going to stop funding you. You've solved it. Congratulations. Get a day job. Oh, did they howl. Of course, he was never able to, to complete it complete it because, you know, he was a monster for having said the truth. But that's what you have to do. Um, and I mean, isn't that part of like long term, just not, it's the government should get out of the realm of ideas? Well, Terrence Keeley, I don't think, I think you may know Terrence. Yeah, we've met before. Right. Wrote a book called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, uh, in which he showed that when governments take over science, and we have wonderful cases where countries were all pretty much private science, and then they became government science. Uh, and we have countries that have a lot of government science, countries that don't have much. The rates of scientific progress is measured by in sort of standard economic metrics. It, they don't change. If, if what happens is, and the OECD found this to their chagrin, because they are the OECD, that public taxpayer money crowds out other research funding and creates a monolith. This is what happened. Look at Bell Labs, seven Nobel Prize winners. Were they funded by the government? Uh-uh. Government takes it over, no more. So yeah, you can do it. It can be done, uh, and uh, um, we're not going to do it. The, the politics has intruded too much in science so that science is simply a political football, and depending upon who's in power, the football is going to go in one direction or the other. Well, I still think it's very important to understand the mechanisms of how destructive uh -huh. it is and, and that there is a pro-freedom alternative that's actually pro -freedom. There is. There so, is. And uh -huh. they, can, they can check out Scientocracy to learn more about it. So what else can, where else can people to go to learn more about you and your work? Well, uh, I'm on the CEI website, www.cei.org, uh, or um, <clears throat> My stuff is still posted at Cato, where I was for quite some time. Um, and uh, you can go to Amazon and just look. I think I got eight or nine books out, um, including the one with the quintuple entendre title, which is called The Satanic Gases. Yeah, that is a great title. <laughs> I have to admit, I didn't come up with it. A colleague of mine came up with it at UVA, Bruce A. Yeah, that's a terrific title. All right. And the most the two most recent are Scientocracy and Lukewarming. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So everyone check out those. Pat, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, yeah. By the way, this guy over here, he's got like a really good book coming out. I he wrote this book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And I put a blurb on it and said this is like the best thing ever written on this subject in this in this uh, meme. And um the new one, what's it called again? Fossil Future. Fossil Future. The new one's even better. Uh, I, I hope it, I hope it sells a bajillion. Thank you, and thanks thanks for your help. It's gotten even mean, way better since you saw it, in part thanks to your feedback. Well, it's it's great. Alex can do one thing that most other people in science and technology can't, which is he can write. He's very readable, very clear. Get the book. All right. Thanks, Kev. I get the other ones first because mine won't be out for a while. So lukewarming, Scientocracy. Thanks so much, Pat. Bye, Alex.
thanks again to Pat Michaels for joining me. So I hope you enjoyed getting an overview of how government distorts science in general and then in climate science in particular. As we were talking toward the end and he, he was giving some additional examples of just how the government distorts things in ways that are just transparent, like the wildfire example I gave and then the, uh, you know, the sea level rise example and he had other ones in that category. I wanna compile those. I think it'd be very valuable to just have, you know, there, there's some recent ones in terms of this so-called ocean acidification issue. I think it'd be really good to have just a compilation of all the documented distortions of climate science by government because there's so much of a perception with science that because there is something called a scientific method, that science is somewhat incorruptible. And unfortunately, that's not the case at all because it can be can be distorted in so many different ways from uh, where, where funding goes, what researchers get promoted, what journals publish, when people are doing different kinds of syntheses like the IPCC, what, what, what is considered worthy of synthesizing, then when the findings are summarized, or who, one thing we talked about with Ross McKittrick, like who is the lead author, like who does the synthesis, then once the synthesis exists, what, what is the summary of that? And then once the summary exists, what the media choose to report. And so you can have something where you can have this phenomenon of something that is really not a big concern in terms of our warming impact uh, on the world, and which is a real thing, but I don't think a particularly concerning thing. And you can have that be this existential catastrophe that requires creating a true existential catastrophe of rapidly eliminating fossil fuel use. So I hope, I, I focus on this quite a bit in Fossil Future and one of, one of the chapters is really devoted to this issue and I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. All right, as always, uh, let's, let's wrap up. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Make sure you're on my mailing list, alexepsteinlist.com. I'm publishing talking points on Twitter at twitter.com slash Alex Epstein. Lots of new uh, Bitcoin enthusiasts have been following me lately. So it's, it's good to have them and see them be exposed to these ideas and share ideas with them. Uh, also energytalkingpoints.com has the comp has uh, compiled points. And let's see what else. I th there was one more thing I wanna mention. Oh yeah. I will be, if, if all goes well, by the time you see this, I will have testified in front of Congress this week. So uh, I'm excited about that. The last time I testified was in 2016, where I had an interesting interaction with Barbara Boxer, among others. Uh, so we'll see what happens this time, but there could be more, uh, more fireworks uh, because at least one of the heads of the committee that is going to be, that invited me is quite aggressively anti-fossil fuel. So We'll see what happens there, but very much looking forward to that. And I think that is it for now. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back next week with another great guest. Oh, one more thing. Yeah, so Fossil Future, um, we should have the webpage up on Amazon with the release date and everything in the next week. I know I keep saying this, but really seems like it's finalized now. So hoping that's going to happen. Uh, and also, if you want to support our efforts by becoming an accelerator, you can learn about how to do that at industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. All right, now I am really done. I'll be back next week with another great guest. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.